<laughs> Our first speaker tonight is Rajiv Malhotra, who is a very, uh, I've met him a number of years ago, and I always found him to be one of the deepest souls around. He's an Indian American researcher and public intellectual on current affairs, world religions, cross cultural encounters, and science. His focus is on interventions that challenge and disrupt many assumptions concerning Indian civilization. He's the author of Breaking India by Amaryllis Press, Being Different by Harper Collins, and the chief protagonist in Invading the Sacred by Rupert Company. He's also the chairman of the Board of Governors of the Indic Studies Center at the U University of Massachusetts Dartmouth. He's a scientist by training. Rajiv was previously a senior corporate executive, strategic consultant, and entrepreneur in telecommunications, information technology, and media. I'll also add off the cuff that he's also the head of the Infinity Foundation, which has done so much by funding projects that really bring the deeper level of Vedic knowledge and Indian knowledge to the West and to the world. I was thinking of that one expression by Ian Schumacher that said, think globally and act locally. I think Rajiv Mahotra takes it to the next level, which he thinks cosmically and acts universally. So tonight he will be speaking on the evolution of Yagya from the Vedas to Maharshi and beyond. Please welcome Rajiv Mahotra. Thank you. And thank you, uh, John Higlin and others at uh, MUM for hosting this event. I think it's a wonderful location to discuss uh, Vedic science and, and Waves is in fact honored to have its 11th event here. I'm delighted to be here. I will first give you a little bird's eye view of what I'm going to say. Uh, I'll start with a thought experiment. And just to forewarn you, uh, I'll ask uh, provocative, uh, I'll ask you to imagine provocative scenarios uh, because thought experiments are used in physics and other sciences to analyze reality. The, the thought experiment is not necessarily something that can happen practically. It doesn't have to be practical, but it has to be a theoretical possibility. So I want to do some thought experiments to provoke you to uh, think of the question, you know, can pundits be replaced with robots? Or uh, wearable technology where you close your eyes and you think you're pouring this glass of milk, but actually it's tactile stuff coming from your gloves and uh, animation coming into your eyes. Uh, and if you could do that, then could Amazon with drones deliver a journal to your house, like you're planning on delivering pizza? And, and how? what is the future? What is, in other words, with this uh, thought experiment, where, where I'm going is, um, what is to be kept intact from the Vedic tradition as we know it, and what is substitutable for adaptation purposes? And what research is needed in order to answer this question? Because if we are not clear about this question, we either end up being too orthodox and frozen in time, afraid to make changes, or too loosey-goosey end up as new age where anything goes and we make substitutions which are not scientific. So we need to have the science understood. For instance, in the case of TM, uh, Maharishi's movement has done the preeminent research of peer-reviewed uh, publications on the effects of meditation. And so we, we know that you cannot just arbitrarily get rid of your mantra, remove your mantra and put something random. The particular mantra has a particular effect, so you cannot substitute. We know that that, that, that is a real thing, we know scientifically. We know the uh, Maharishi effect, how it works. So you cannot just do something arbitrary and say, well, you know, that's, we went to a rock concert and we had a Maharishi effect. You cannot do that. <laughs> so scientific investigation is necessary in order to uh, continue the evolution of Vedic science for other cultures and other epochs. So to start with my um, thought experiment, Imagine uh, somebody says to you that uh, there is an iPod that is chanting mantra or a smartphone that's chanting mantra, perfect intonation, accent, everything. It's going on chanting for a long time. And the question is, will, will this device become enlightened? 
That's a serious question. So how many of you, show of hands, think that it would become a light? Because it's chanting mantra. Nobody. Okay. So it's important to understand why. Uh, consciousness, it has to be a conscious chanting. There has to be prana and human consciousness involved. It is not just making a certain sound that constitutes mantra. That mantra or vak involves prana. It involves human consciousness, otherwise you just have it sound. One could ask a different question. Suppose I hear mantra coming out of an iPod. Could I have the effect? Could I have the mantra effect? Even though it's not produced by a living pundit, it's being produced by a machine. And if you said in the first experiment that it's really a mantra only if it has prana. This one doesn't have prana, but I'm, I'm the one listening to it, does it mean I'm wasting my time? Or do you think it will have effect? Show of hands, how many of you think it will have effect? Okay, good, most people. And that is because while I'm listening to a sound, which is a mechanical sound, my inner being, my psychology, reproduces that sound with the mantra, with the, with the prana and with the consciousness. So there's an echoing inside. What I'm hearing, it's being replicated inside. And it's this replication, it's this, the way I'm receiving the mantra and replicating it, uh, kind of almost like an echo. That reception, and unconsciously I'm, it's ha happening, it's not like I'm consciously uh, repeating it, it's just happening, the act of hearing has an inner mimicry or inner replica of uh, or inner recreation of what is being heard and that recreation has consciousness and is pranic and so that would work. So now we go to another thought experiment. What if we, it's not just mantra, but we are, we are performing a whole yajna. So we are doing the rudra vishekam uh, or we could be doing a fire homa. So there could be shivalingam and uh, one is pouring something, pouring milk, uh, you know, it could be a fire, one is lighting the fire, one has to feed the heat, one has to put some objects and substances in it. Now, suppose there's a scenario which says that we have a robot that performs this. And this robot is very well trained, it knows exactly, it has all the right materials. If you need a coconut, there's a coconut. If you need agni, there's a real agni. I mean, everything is really there, material-wise. Uh, it could even be wearing a dhoti if you want the robot to wear it. <laughs> so there's, you could make this robot as real looking as possible and such that you wouldn't even be able to tell the difference. And it is performing flawlessly all the actions. It is performing flawlessly. The question is, will this have the effect of the yagna? How many of you think it will? Uh, one, okay. Uh, or half, the course to change the mind. So, uh, and I guess it's a fairly obvious thing that this is this doesn't have the consciousness in it, and it's just a mechanical enactment. Now, now a little tricky one. The next one is suppose there's no robot and there is nothing outside. I am wearing these goggles, and that is giving me a really perfect three-dimensional. Uh, you know, yagna going on, whichever kind of one it happens to be. And my role, my enactment I am doing with my eyes not really looking out, it's just looking at the goggles. And I'm wearing these, these gloves, which are wearable technology, such that uh, when, I, when I do this to lift the pot, which has the milk in it, I actually feel that I'm holding a pot. Because the tactile sense of holding a metal is conveyed to me through the gloves. And when I lift it, I feel the weight. And I, in the screen, it actually shows that my hand is doing it. But actually, there's nothing happening outside. And then when I do this, I start pouring. Actually, there's nothing in my hands, but I see milk being poured. I hear the sound of the milk being poured. I feel some cool breeze. I feel the glass becoming less and less weighty as the milk is empty. And then I put it down. I hear the click when I put it down. So. In fact, every minutest detail of all my senses is taken care of in this technology, this wearable technology, and, the, and I'm having this inner experience. 
I'm actually having this inner experience, whether it exists outside or not, the point is I, to me, there's no way of telling it, the difference. Every little detail is exactly as if I were outside, you know, really doing all these things, but no substance exists, out, the material things do not exist, it is being kind of stimulated for me. How many of you think this should have the effect of a real gun? Okay, see? That's what it's tricky about it. About 30-40% said yes. Very interesting. So, what exactly is going on? So, this is what has to be tested scientifically to, to come up with an exact position on what, whether this is possible. If it is possible, then you know, you could substitute, you could, not, you, you could fulfill Maharishi's uh, plan for 200,000 pundits by giving, by having this mass produced technology and everybody could be doing this. And uh, you could be downloading whichever yagna you want to do. So today you do the fire yagna and the program for that, the same equipment would do the, another day to do a different yagna. Uh, so this virtual reality and all of that would be able to perform all the yagnas for you and you don't need pundits, you can have a big cost reduction and scale, scale the plan real fast. Now, the issue is, will that work? And this is a very serious question. It's a thought experiment, but it's intended to make you think. And then I, I want to extrapolate some ideas and take it further to what I'm really trying to say. The yajna, or a process to work, as prescribed in the Vedas, has both an outer dimension and an inner dimension. The outer reality of materials and substances is important. Physicality is important. There is something called sacred material, things like vibhuti. There are sacred substances. Flowers have properties, plants have properties. It's not just my imagining that, but it is really physically there. Uh, when so, when uh, Maharishi says that the Shakti Peetams, the particular locations in India, have to be re-enlivened, it is not just some arbitrary piece, piece of real estate, it is something specific in that piece of that location. That location has some specific physical aspects and characteristics which are not generically found somewhere else. So you cannot substitute the physical, physical location of the Shakti Peters. You, in the same way, there are certain properties of certain material things that you cannot replace with something else. Just like you cannot replace a mantra with some other sound, or you cannot replace a molecule which is medicinal to, with some other one, or a plant with some other one because the effect will be different. So, the outer dimension of what you are doing is part of the cosmic, cosmic physics. It is, this enactment is affecting the cosmic physics and that is the effect that you're looking for. And there is the, simultaneously there is the inner dimension that this has to be a conscious act. It cannot be conscious imagination. You see the scenario I gave you, the final scenario I gave you, would not be consciously acting it will be consciously kind of imagining that you're acting, but you're, the physicality of that matter is not really there. So in the first, in, in, the pre, in a previous scenario, uh, when we had robots, the physical enactment was perfect, but there was no inner realm, because they, they don't have an inner realm, the robots don't have a psychology, they don't have pran and, 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 and uh, consciousness in the human sense. So they, they are doing the outer enactment without the inner. And in the second, uh, in the last uh, uh, example, the last thought experiment, there is the inner realm because psychologically everything is happening, but there is no outer realm. And the point being that you need both. You, the, you need both to have a proper yajna. So if you can establish this scientifically, then you will have a case that says the pandit cannot be uh, replaced. That would be the scenario, so sorry for those who want to uh, do a cost reduction. That's, 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 the, that's the, uh, the effect of this. Now, why am I saying this? Uh, so, for the, so the scientific research, I want to generalize from this, pundit to more general things. Uh, can the Shakti Peetans be replaced? Uh, what, is the, uh, what is the significance of uh, rituals, uh, various, uh, you know, the Kumbh Mela is a physical thing in a certain place at a certain time. So can we just sort of make it arbitrary, an arbitrary place at an arbitrary time and do those things? Or is there something very specific that, that makes that happen, that produces the effect that is claimed? So these are, each one of these things 
is the subject for healthy scientific research. The sanskars, there are Vedic sanskars that are given. There is a reason why the Vedas prescribe that certain sanskars are given at various points in time in a person's life. And these Vedic sanskars are real things done physically outside yourself and inside yourself and they cannot be substituted with something else. This is, this is a very real uh, claim in the, in the Vedas. And the question is, can uh, the Maharishi movement take the lead in scientific research in this, just as it did in meditation, just as it did in Maharishi effect and TMCD and various other things. And the plan would be to find out what are the things that cannot be changed, so people better not change them. And we, we have to be clear that as a matter of uh, integrity of the Vedic process, these are things that cannot be changed. And what are the things that can and should be changed for adaptation? And what are the rules of transformation? What are the rules of substitution? Vedas contain some rules, some principles. I, I'm writing a book on all this stuff and I will explain in that. What are some of the rules of substitution? So when you, when you, when some item can be substituted without destroying the functionality, you can produce the same functionality but with a different, in a different way, different manifestation. What are some of the rules, some of the processes, some of the principles that, that govern how you make a substitution? This is something very uh, important to do. The reason this is this kind of exercise matters is that uh, India must uh, adapt the Vedic science and technologies for the new epoch. It cannot just go back in time. It, for the 21st century, India has to uh, adapt the Vedic knowledge uh, for today. And so it must know what cannot be changed and what must be changed and how the substitution works. And as far as the United States is concerned, the export from India to the United States is an export into another culture and again adaptation is needed. So adaptation is needed in the same place when there's a new epoch and adaptation is needed when it goes from one culture to another culture. So again we need to have exact rules. Now Maharishi knew these things. So he prescribed this is how it's to be done. But we have to figure out what are the rules so that we, without Maharishi, are able to do this. And this is a real challenge. And this is not a trivial thing. Now the reason this is important is that uh, I study a phenomenon called digestion. Vedic civilization gets digested into non-Vedic civilization by being taken apart into little components and pieces and parts of it uh, reformulated and absorbed into other ways of life. And so the integrity of the process is destroyed because certain things that cannot change are changed and certain things that are are to be changed under certain rules of transformation and substitution are changed in a very ad hoc manner. So uh, this is this is uh, this is the center of my inquiry, and the next book I'm doing is I'm doing a case study of several lineages and movements to see which ones kept their integrity, which ones lost it, why they lost it, and one of the vulnerabilities is when the original guru leaves. Uh, the leadership continues doing well because they are all in fact, uh, they have all been impacted by that guru so much and, and they, that they continue doing well. But when there is a generational change to new generation of leaders and these new generation of leaders were not in contact with the original guru, they just did not soak it in, they have not imbibed it. Because you know, a guru is always doing initiations which you may not even be conscious of. The Guru is doing subliminary initiations to the people who are very close to him. So these new, this next generation never got that and then the, they, they could go one extreme or the other. They could go the orthodox extreme and freeze everything and just be muttering and repeating and you know not understanding why they're doing these things in which case it's a fossil. Or they could go the other extreme and turn into new age and I've seen many examples of both. So this is a good point in time for the Maharishi movement to become cognizant of this risk and also this opportunity because if you can excavate and understand the scientific principles, why did Maharishi say that uh, this Shakti Pilam is important? Or why did Maharishi say that this Yagana is important? And so on, if you, can, if you can have the same rigor 
in research as you already have in Ayurveda and meditation, then this would be a major breakthrough in Vedic knowledge for everybody today. Now, I'll give you a few examples of things not being done correctly. Uh, and I'm doing another piece of work, research, on how some people have appropriated TN and turned it into something else and in the end distorted it. And there are some examples, for instance, Christian centering prayer, which is uh, something formulated by Father Keating, who learned a lot here in Maharishi University, brought a lot of people, he learned a lot of things. And then they went back and they turned it to something else to put Jesus inside. And the Jesus inside meant that silence is not good for them. Because they, they imagine doing TN but you don't like silence. What 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 is that? Because it, it because it contradicts this idea that you know silence is sort of an opportunity for the devil to sneak in. So you always have to keep yourself full of something. So therefore there's Jesus inside imagery and affirmation of Jesus is a, is a is like the mantra almost. So you you substituted something and it is not something compliant with Vedic science. It hasn't been tested uh, as to what its effect is. So you can get some benefits and think that you are doing this process, but actually you're not. Similarly, uh, Herb Benson uh, in Harvard made a huge career taking transcendental meditation and reformulating it, calling it the relaxation response, getting his trademarks and all those things and made a huge killing on it. So I'm doing a lot of research on them, these guys and also people like Deepak Chopra and various others to see how this Vedic science has moved into the hands of other people and what is the, what has been compromised and where the transformation is okay and where the transformation is not okay. This is the heart of what I'm studying. Now, uh, in the opening night, Craig Pearson made a wonderful talk in the keynotes uh, about how Vedic Enlighten, Vedic science and enlightenment is not only Eastern. Lots of anybody can have it. And gave many examples from Jesus Christ, I mean, in his book, examples from Jesus Christ to Western philosophers and poets, English poets, French people, uh, all the way to uh, the comedian Karen Burnett. So that made me think. So uh, that made me think of the following. And since I don't, haven't done this uh, you know, investigation on each of these persons, as a scientist, I have to start as a skeptic and apply my due diligence. So I apply the following criteria. Are we sure what was their state of consciousness in which they described this exalted experience? And just because they described it, what does it mean? It could also be delusional. It could also be a hallucination. I, mean, I have a friend who's an anesthesiologist and he says that sometimes when the people come out of anesthesia, they, they have this idea that they're flying, they're going to fire the window, and everything's become one, and they're zoned out, kind of, you know. So, uh, one of the anecdotes, uh, one of the cases that, uh, of uh, enlightenment that uh, he mentioned, that Craig had mentioned, is a woman who had an accident, so she checks into a place, and uh, she's sleeping there, and there's a fireplace, and then she begins to get this feeling that she's one with everything, and she's one with the fire in the room, and things like that. And then when she gets up the next morning, uh, she's back to normal and none of this she can understand. So this raises the other thing, the other issue. If, for, if it's Vedic science, then there is a procedural method to cause it. There is, an, there, is a, there is a recipe for how you practice it to lead to a certain goal. And it is reproducible. And it is teachable. You can teach others. And it is measurable. Now, if the person could not even reproduce it again herself, so then it would be considered a one-off freak. It's not science. One-off freak is not science. One-off freak may, may, may be something interesting and you have to investigate further before it's admissible as scientific evidence, but just because one-off something happens does not by itself uh, make it science. So, the, 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 uh, I think we have to be a little careful uh, uh, to, to uh, before we say that uh, all these claims and all these exotic, exalted experiences are in fact the same thing as the seventh state of consciousness, uh, if the effect of anesthesia could be enlightenment, 
then they would, I'm sure somebody would get FDA approval to have an injection for enlightenment. And they'd be out there selling this, saying, you come and you can do this. And this is not just a joke, because uh, there is a product, a beverage launched in California called Somaras in a can. I don't know if you know about this, but Soma in a can. And the ad starts, I mean, I found this out because a young yoga teacher from India got talked into being an endorser. They wanted some guy who was sitting like a yogi, chanting, and they wanted that guy to endorse it. So he did it, and he was very proud, so he came to me and said, you know, you'll be very happy, we are going mainstream. Now, Vedic culture is all over the place, it's going mainstream. So he showed me on his laptop all these uh, launch events, and I had a copy of this video. So in this video, uh, they start off by saying that these great rishis, you know, thousands of years ago did so much meditation and so much tapas and austerities and to achieve and uh, attain somaras, but you can just get it for five dollars. <laughs> so, so, careless substitution, too much substitution, too much free willing that anything goes, and everybody is enlightened who sort of says so. And you know, we're going to have this enlightenment party and everybody gets a $10 ticket and we can do a can of song or something like that. I mean, the point is, that is exactly what the LSD people were trying to do. But they weren't enlightened. And in fact, Maharishi made a very strong argument against all that practice. He just didn't want people using psychotropic drugs to get that kind of a feeling. And well, of course those guys could write all that poetry which you would read and say, this guy must be at stage seven. And you know, you could go to any small town in India and you'll find some guys smoking charas and bhang and they'll be talking this world-class stage seven poetry. But it is not enlightenment. And so it has to be scalable, teachable, measurable. It has to be a systematic process that's reproducible. You have to do longitudinal studies scientifically to see what is the effect of that, what effect does it, uh, does it produce. Uh, is there is it capable of bringing a long-term transformation in the practitioner or is it just a one-off free thing that happens and you don't know why it happens? And this is the reason I don't think that people like Eckhart Tolle can claim to be in the same league because he had an experience or he was sitting somewhere in Vienna in a bench uh, in a park and he was eating ice cream and he, something happened and all that kind of stuff happened. He doesn't know why it happened. He cannot tell you to do some things to make it happen. There is no procedure, way, systematic way to do it happen. It cannot be tested, it cannot be certified. So I think we would, one of the risks as we go through this generational change and as adaptations are needed is to start having too many of them without the rigor of scientific investigation, which is why I started out by saying that all these kinds of changes that we can think about in thought experiments need to be checked out in a, in a very rigorous way. So the Risk is if the anything goes and anything quali qualifies as, as transcendent, transcending and uh, enlightenment, then you have a, a kind of moral relativism, ethical relativism, but worst of all, epistemic relativism, which means that you can adopt any worldview, any cosmology, any epistemology, and you can say it's just as good. And this is, this is where I think the integrity would, would fall apart. Now, if I compare all this with all these possibilities that could go wrong, with Maharishi's own choices and his own journey, as he proceeded, he became more and more uh, aware of the efficacy of Vedic processes and, and, and in fact, became, started adding more and more of those. So he started with TM and TM Siddhi and, and the Maharishi effect, but then he, he adds Jyotish, he adds uh, Ayurveda, he adds uh, Vastu, and most important, and, and then Shakti Pitams, that you have to go to those particular places. Uh, but most impressive is a very consistent, lifelong Guru Puja. This, this very close bond and link with his Guru. And so we need to understand the physics of Guru Link. What is the physics of Guru Link? And I have a theory on that, which I've been writing about, that, you know, these enlightened masters have always been very humble about giving a huge amount of respect to their gurus, no matter how enlightened they are, but they are so close to that, the gurus, that I feel that the Guru Link is itself an ongoing channel of intelligence, an ongoing channel of guidance, an ongoing channel of spontaneous, you know, intuitive, uh, you know, kind of 
character we have. It's almost like there is this Wi-Fi link or a broadband link that they connected there. And they don't want to break that. So if through physics and through our, our, our knowledge we can produce a model which says this is important, then that's another item that is not modifiable. That you, you cannot just wander off. You have to be part of a lineage. You have that lineage is important because this lineage goes back, back to early to the sources. So Maharishi kept his lineage intact. From back to Adiyak Shankara and even before that, he kept all that intact. And so it means that we are to do that, uh, to really be in that particular, uh, to learn from him and to, to carry out what he said. The guru link is a part of it. So I I've laid out several things that, several hurdles that one would have to cross in order to pluck something out and digest it into something else. Because all these are obstacles. So if you look at uh, people who left the TM movement and turned against it, they have a website which talked about it. There's, I don't agree with them at all. And in fact, I, I use it to diagnose a certain uh, problem, a certain syndrome. And the syndrome is that they, these are people who have one problem. And the one problem is that they cannot accept Vedic Devatas. That is the hurdle. The Vedic Devatas are kind of scary to them because they have this, uh, you know, uh, this uh, polytheism fear. The fear of polytheism is sort of lurking in them. They, they're, they're so indoctrinated to a point of view, although Vedic Devatas are not the same thing as polytheism in the pagan sense, in the pre-Christian European sense. Vedic Devatas are entirely different and a very scientific phenomenon. But they have this kind of a fear, and so they, they kind of react against it once they discover that this is an important part of the uh, part of the core practice. So if you want authenticity to continue into the future and into the next generation, then this generation of leaders has to do the research and has to put down what is non-changeable. So there are devatas, there is guru puja, there is shakti pitams, there are certain yajnas that have been done by human beings and not by robots. And, and, and so on and so forth. There's a lot of this which are non-negotiable. And so there is a lot that can change, a lot can be adapted to new lifestyles and new conditions, but there are certain core practices that cannot. And if they are to be changed, then there, there should be equivalent ways of producing the same functionality. There should be equivalent way of producing whatever the function was that this thing was doing, you've got to find a new way to do it. So uh, I, uh, I will uh, uh, close with a reading from Maharishi, uh, just so you understand that these risks that I'm pointing out are not limited to uh, transferring this Vedic knowledge to the United States. He's very, very concerned about the state of affairs in India. Uh, this is his criticism of the Indian constitution and the Indian government, and you should hear this, please. This is quite amazing. This is in 2001. He said, those people who are holding the reins of Indian administration should know their administration is not of Indian origin. The Indian constitution promoted by Jawaharlal Nehru is not Indian because it does not nourish the life of either Brahmins, Kshatriyas, Vaishyas or Shudras. It is not suited for the survival and evolution of pure life. It does not cater to the natural specialties of Brahmins, Kshatriyas, Vaishyas, or Shudras. It does not even suit the requirements of Brahmachari, Grihast, Vanprast, or Sanyas, the different stages of life. It is a copy of non-Indian ideals of life, which have resulted from thousands of years of slavery of foreign powers in India. Sounds familiar. We are doing all this decolonizing, and Maharishi was onto it long before. Through Dev Yag Devta Yagya, Bhakti, and Vedanta, so he's clear on this. Devta, Yajna, Bhakti, and Vedanta. We are trying to bless the world with the ancient Indian heritage, the Vedic heritage. But the government of India is suppressing the reality of Indian life through its laws. We strongly condemn the word secular. And sorry, Professor Papuji, who was talking about how secular is now uh, Vedic culture and Hinduism are secular. I happen to disagree with that. And I agree with Maharishi that if you really understand what secular means, 
it means the removal of devatas and things like that, and then you really have to start it. So here's what he says, we strongly condemn the word secular and the meaning of secularism that governs the administration of the government of India, and which dismisses the scientific reality of devatas and yajyas, and has put these most fundamental fields of intelligence out of government policy. So secular means all these things have got to go, to be secular, to impress other people who are bothered by it, and that violates the Vedic way of life. For India to be ideal, it has to rise to invinci invincibility through the wisdom of the Veda, through devotion to devatas and yajyas, and through the performance of yajya for the individual to rise to his cosmic potential. The deep roots of dharma have been cruelly invaded by the British, American, and German Christian-oriented philosophy of life. It is a shame for Indians living in the land of the Veda to allow the fundamentals of their Vedic knowledge to be invaded and virtually crucified by the shallow and very superficial principles of Christendom, baseless principles of life in the name of national unity. So this is Maharishi Mahesh Yogi's uh, injunction on keeping the integrity of Vedic lifestyle also for India, where he felt the whole thing is falling apart. So with that, I will conclude and like to take questions. Thank you so much. Outsider. <laughs> so now we have about 10 minutes for questions so people can come up. 